so we look at uh, 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 our experiments or surveys i call it uh, we look at it in two ways uh, one is uh, one is before we even envision or do something these is these are market research i'll club it under market research and uh, there are very sharp questions and we understand demographics i think most folks would understand how this is done but a simple articulation of this would be you know look at ask very simple non leading questions and probably this customers just have one option yes or no or a very simple list of you know two three options that they can choose from right so these are pre pre product or pre you know just trying to understand the pulse of with yet another episode on our CPO series today we are very very excited to have been joined by Tejas who currently leads product program and design at Big Basket he's had a long long stint there has been there from the very beginning and i'm sure you're going to learn a lot from this episode do stay tuned um he was also the founder of Byte Menu um uh, and has been in this industry for over 17 to 18 years almost two decades of product experience even before product management was very hot um and i know today i think a lot of you all do discuss hyper local commerce so we're going to learn a lot uh, from tejas experience uh, tejas thank you so much for joining us today it's a huge pleasure to be here suhas thank you for having me awesome kicking this right off tejas uh, one fun question to begin is um, always wondered you've been on tech and product for the longest time and over a decade at uh, big basket now So, if you could swap roles with anyone at Big Basket for a day, imagine you got bored of product. Uh, who do you think that would be, and why? I'll be uh, more of a lead on the customer experience side. Uh, someone in the support team who gets to talk to customers. I just enjoy talking to customers, hearing their problems, hearing what they like, what they dislike. I think it's a it's a joy to be talking and hearing them out. Interesting, and I think that's probably. one of the largest attributes to being a good product manager right if you really want to build good products as a product manager as well you need to be very close to the customer so i think you've picked a very nice adjacent space and that probably loops into your daily role as well but um there has been a long journey right from uh, you know your your four year stint um then founding byte menu to launching i think uh, i think your four year stint was launching one of india's first browsers right um and then you know a slight sense that being a founder then now leading product for big basket right from the early stages it's been a very very eventful career um i'd love to know if you could share some you know of these pivotal points that you can reflect on uh, in your career and you know uh, what really you know you took off from each of these roles um, and even within big basket as you've seen 0 to 1 1 to 10 10 to 100 to where it is today what do you think are those pivotal points in your career sure Uh, well it started uh, let me first go to my early days when uh, you know i was studying and i wanted to i was a bit of a geek and wanted to get into phd get into academics and uh, i in fact opted for a phd thesis kind of a route uh, studying abroad and at one point i decided that hey you know uh, this was the moment when india was shining 2003 2004 and uh, that's when i realized maybe th- that's where i want to be and i want to start building something create some impact since then that's been my journey so started of me with heading back to india starting to look out for startups uh, i spent two years in tcs but trying to get a sense of the landscape and how things evolve uh, at zero experience but with that good bit of experience i got into an early stage startup which is a uh, hidden reflex i was a founding employee there and since then have started building products that's what this was 2005 2006 right and started building products since then and uh, well was coded the whole browser coded the build the product around it and uh, we it was a launch for the us market to build a, a news aggregation service in 2006 2007 it took us a year or so to build pivotal moment here is uh, well there was no product market fit that we were looking in the, in that company we were just trying to build something which we think is right we hadn't even spoken to too many customers maybe a bits and pieces but i think we worked we slogged for almost a year year and a half 
and when we went out it with our product and showcased it to our first set of customers after all that effort i think they just rubbed it off and this doesn't look good that doesn't look good there was just way too much feedback pivotal moment in my product journey is that i think it needs to be a lot more iterative you just can't think of an end product without even incrementally working to or at least validating your your product time and again uh so we finally revamped the product went ahead to the market uh, and showcased that to our customers uh, uh i think it did well reasonably well but uh, there were still a lot of challenges the market had moved a lot uh, beyond at that point in time and we kind of tried to struggle to get funding there in parallel we tried to build something for the indian audience and that's the browser so we uh, uh we took up the entire firefox uh, code base and started building a wrapper around it uh completely repurposed it and, and there was a browser around that time in 2008 2009 called flock uh, but we we had a completely different proposition and especially for the indian audience we built uh wallpapers we built uh, antivirus we built chat we built sidebars and we built a bunch of stuff today and basically a holistic view of it the entire add on ecosystem under a a plugin ecosystem of a mozilla firefox but build a solid product out of it and very much geared to an indian audience because we introduced facets of typing within regional languages which in 2008 2009 was a rarity and built a lot of other bunch of stuff we launched it it got great traction we at any at one point in time we had 70000 users and we are still talking 2009 2010 uh pivotal moment uh your customer base was too small enough even at 70000 to be able to get you to uh take you to the next level to secure funding and uh, have those growth leaps that uh, potentially we see easily happening today so we had a great early adopter crowd but we just could not translate that uh, to the next to the next base and incidentally that was also the time when the mobile revolution took place and we were just building browsers for the web so again stay ahead of the curve and do not give up on innovating but don't innovate in a direction which is probably not going to take you further right a uh, lot of learnings there so after four years in hidden reflex started to went into launching my own company byte menu core proposition was to build a menu recommendation system you you like your food you just uh, add them to your wish list and you search based on what you want to cook and get the best recommendation from your nearby restaurants uh we tried some few incubators didn't do well uh, i had also in the interim gone on you know uh, trying to do some sabbatical uh, I, i went on a sabbatical in fact in the himalayas in the everest region for a month by myself i was in, i was just all by myself there were some near death experiences but again uh, uh, i mean just a lightning fall you know struck behind me just about 2 meters behind me and it was a deadly lightning and it was a storm out there i was on a edge of a precipice some stories that can be spoken on a on a different day and time but uh, a great learning experience and i would say uh, i think more of a spiritual journey i i think i was burnt out in those four years uh, and uh, i think i i came back a lot more positively and in that positive zone you know i was freelancing and that's when i stumbled upon big basket uh, so just a pivotal moment give yourself a break in your career at least that break actually removed all the negativity after having failed in two within two products and also co-founded something which didn't work out well but i think it was an eye opener to stay positive uh so the next journey was i continue to freelance i was never the guy who stick around for in a large setup i wanted to build something and impactful and that's when I got a call from uh you know to seek out some uh, opportunity in big basket and someone doing online grocery and just was in indira nagar area and i just stumbled by and i just dropped in and that's when the conversation began i was the first guy uh, and and since then it's history uh so again started off very low and at that point in time no one had the confidence in fact the first i was just asking so you actually want people to buy onions and tomatoes i was asking the founders yes and i was just asking you know how how would that even happen like you like it has happened for electronics and i just gave it a bit of a thought and why not why won't people buy onions and potatoes online right and that conviction from the founders and i think that conviction got into me too at that point in time that why not right i mean that's the future uh 
and of course, I am a science science fiction buff, so why not? So uh, that that's how it, the journey started. A lot of optimism and uh, belief in the product and what we are trying to build. Since then, like you said, uh, so has three journeys, zero to one. The first three years were literally building the product market fit. Started off in Bangalore in a small area for deliveries within the Whitefield area, few apartment complexes. Got great validation. People loved the service. Uh, now, one very interesting pivotal learning in this moment is now I've learned, I had a lot of friends and peers in the startup ecosystem and everyone was pushing for a very hardcore growth, you know, get your customers and that is the most important thing that matters, right? And the learning that I got here is, you know, your your customers, you can just get them onboarded. There are ways to get these customers. But what matters is the customer experience, the the journey, the trust that you build uh, for them in your product, right? And I think that was a big learning moment, a pivotal moment. And the whole one, zero to one journey was continuing to build upon trust and uh, build upon uh, getting those customers back, right? And any customer you lose, you're always trying to wonder what have you done wrong? What what was the operational problem that you couldn't solve for? Or what was the journey where they got confused and just dropped off, right? So that was the phase when we just built a lot of stuff and get got it from the ground up. Uh, the 1 to 10 phase was all about stabilization. When you have so many product lines starting getting formulated, you had early competition coming in. This was 2013, 14. You had your first hyper-local uh, competitive competition coming out in the form of Amazon Flipkarts and there are a few others, uh, you know, Pepper Taps and all that. So a huge onslaught. And at that time we had, we were always, we have always been a lean team, always through and through. We are still a very lean team. So with this lean team, what do you pick and choose and keep your product stable, continue building on trust yet grow and look at competition, what they are doing. It was probably one of the hardest phases because you just did not have that mind space to continue growing and also being stable and fight against competition, right? Uh, so pivotal moment, don't give up on your core proposition. Our core proposition was always to continue building trust and give the best experience for people buying groceries, right? And you could have all types of onslaughts from your customers, right? If you stick with what customers love you for, I think no matter what happens, just stay the course, be patient. Uh, history will repeat itself and, you know, that has happened even in the later phases, right? Uh, the last part of the journey was the 10 to 100. This is when an organization starts becoming quote-unquote semi-corporate. We still call mm -hmm. ourselves startup come corporate. Uh -huh. uh, this is a slightly different phase and for folks like me who are uh, a lot more, I think, entrepreneurial by nature and want things moving, you will see... Uh, you you need to bring systems in place. You need to bring process in place to ensure there is less chaos. Uh, because the people also that you will start getting in are not your uh, so-called you know startup folks. You could get them, uh, but uh, I think they'll also come with uh, some expectations of a mid stage mid stage Series C Series D plus startup and will have a slightly different mindset. So this phase is all about stabilization. And how you balance expectations of maybe agility, uh, which which has been your strength all this while, to balance it out with platform stability and ensuring the right things go in, managing so many product lines together. So how do you reuse stuff, right? So for example, when I'm building a functionality today for a particular product line, the question that I would always ask is, if I'm building this, is it going to be useful for any other product line, right? So yeah. reusability at this scale is going to be the most important thing. You can't just build so many product lines in silo uh, and especially at a, with such teams, you know, with multiple teams and different stakeholders. Uh, the value that you can bring to your product is how do you kind of spread out? You build less, but whatever you build, you kind of spread out the impact across all your lines, right? So a uh, pivotal moment, these new learnings, coming through and kind of creating the base to create, continue building up, building upon products. And lastly, where are we at this stage? Uh, very important learning is that competition will keep coming at you. They'll find different yeah. models. They'll, they'll try to keep doing differently. Uh, I think sustainability does matter at the end of the day for you to last, you know, the, the, the horse, which will continue right till the end when we'll win the game and sustainability will mean profitability. 
as much as you do, you know, you try to get growth, you can get as many customers and you might get a huge amount of funding. The one golden rule is sustainability will win because you have to, you, you're building products for the business. You're not building it for the customers or to just for your own ego. It's finally product, a product manager is building it for the business. Of course, it's impacting your customer and you're giving the benefits out to your customers. So that's it. So that's absolutely, absolutely. Thanks so much, Tejas, for going, uh, you know, very deep and sharing this with us. On that last point that you mentioned, I'd love to break that down and uh, go deeper with you there. Um, like you mentioned, I think there has been now an exponential development in rapid commerce, right? Lots of lots of brands coming in here, uh, promising delivery of both, you know, fresh packed food in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, and you all also have a product with BB now here, right? Um, I'd love to understand from you. Uh, you did mention one very key word here, sustainability will take uh, people much farther. But what do you think is BB Now's biggest differentiator? And especially from the product side, uh, how would you strategize to stay ahead? Yes, uh, sustainability is one, but would love to hear uh, some anecdotes. You know, when you think think of the war room situation inside, when you all are brainstorming on the whiteboard, how have you all strategized to stay ahead? Sure. To be very honest, uh, this is a very simple business. If you would just look at it from a macro view, uh, you're, you place an order, it's your nearest store. Uh, pick products and just deliver it. Anyone can build this product. It's not a product problem. It's a business problem, right? So I wouldn't differentiate uh, uh, too much in terms of, uh, uh, you know, your product building. Uh, you know, anyone can build, maybe add more to your basket and there's a unit economics, you know, ramping up basket sizes and you might find it hard to deliver on that experience. The differentiator that I think we bring in is trust that we've built over the years. Now, one thing we will never, ever, ever do is to take an order and not commit on it or deliver on, uh, on not deliver on that, right? This is more of a value. This is more of a trust that we've built with our customers over the years. And today, if I go and say, I'm going to deliver this in 10 minutes, right? And if I just do it 15 minutes, 20 minutes, I don't think I stand for that 10 minute proposition. I think I stand for, I'm going to deliver it to you in 15, 30 minutes and I will deliver it in 15 to 30 minutes as a business proposition. How do, how is it different? Uh, uh, from a growth perspective, let's say we call it 10 minutes and then maybe do 15, 20 minutes Over time customers, maybe they're not as ambivalent. We don't know, or maybe they think this is fine once in a while. Uh, we believe. A predictability and consistency, consistency of your service is far more important. And by calling out 15 to 30 minutes and committing to it, and if we don't commit, we in fact pay 5% delivery guarantee. That's our rule and ethos so that we push our teams to kind of deliver on that promise. For us, that is most important. And I think we know very clearly that that's what matters over the years. We have been doing grocery deliveries over the years. For groceries, we clearly know customer promise matters and commitment matters. And over the years, we have heard complaints. We have seen customer feedback. We have done this multiple times. They love us for the trust that we have built with them, right? That's one very key differentiator and which we will not compromise on. Second is slightly on the business perspective. Uh, we also have a range of products, uh, which we call our private labels, our white label products, which go through a huge rigor of building that kind of a quality perception. Our fruits and vegetables are sourced from farms directly within 24 to 48 hours. Our private labels are atas and chawal and all that stuff. The, uh, the regular staples all come from DB certified mills and it goes through a huge rigor of uh, going through all those quality control process. Literally, we are, if I were to say, just as a, on a private label business, we are already a giant in that context. We are an FMCG giant and just calling that out. But 30, 40% of our uh, 30, 40% of a business comes from a private labels. You, you have read this everywhere. Now, what does, what does it mean today? Be, be, customers are just coming to big basket for the private labels because the trust they have in the BB Royals and the BB Populars and the Freshos. And that is a mode that we have built. It is not a product problem. It is actually a business problem that we have solved for a lot of customers. And we build that kind of a brand attached to this. These are two clear wins that differentiators that we see. But the third differentiator, while I agree with you, maybe keeping sustainability aside, our sustainability in the long term will bank on the synergies in the supply chain that we bring to the fore. So today uh, we have a backend which is able to not just support the 
quick commerce business but it also is very tightly uh, integrated with our in, in, with our supply chain through and through what this brings is a confidence is if you don't find something within db now you can always get that in the big basket uh, uh, route within 3 hours right so that itself we believe is a strong enough mode that you don't necessarily need everything immediately you always have a backup so range point i'm making is whatever you want you'll still get within the big basket universe if not your bb now universe alone so so as that's uh, how we are looking at it very interesting i think uh, great point that you mentioned is uh, maybe product is in the mode but here business is a uh, quick question how much should product managers think about pnls in business do you see this uh, across organizations oh absolutely product managers while not directly accountable for the pnl uh, all product managers need to know the cost to business to building to doing what they are building uh, simple example uh, if i'm if i have a handover resource that i need in for any process mm-hmm. right uh, i am in my operational view if i need one person to do a particular level of grunt work maybe just a just a check on the product and handing it over and this is a job role this is a role right the question that we would uh, i would ask the product manager is what is the cost of running such a resource why do we need this resource and why can't this resource be automated right i mean from a process perspective right so, and that is a direct implication implication on your operational cost so every pnl that happens on a monthly basis a product manager needs to be aware of where the costs are and what can be at least ideated through to bring some of these costs down and today right. at least uh, to the pr- product managers who are very closely associated there with the business there is very good understanding of what costs are going into running each of the hops in the entire operational process and also on the on the user experience side right there are campaigns that are run so why can't some of these campaigns be leveraged using ai ml you know it, why can't smart recommendations kind of drive the whole experience etc so this just runs through the entire value of the product right how do you bring operational slash tactical efficiencies in the whole value chain ultimately impacting the pnl in a positive way right. very interesting i think fair point i think right i think that is where our ecosystem needs to go towards and maybe in this market a lot more i think last year and the years before this was slightly different um it was more on okay growth at all costs so maybe product manager didn't really think too much on this it was like hey okay let's build a product consumers really want we'll figure all this out later but today i think it's a lot more closely integrated um there just one interesting point again from something that you mentioned was you all started with this entire thing of hey how do people purchase grocery online um you built out a very robust uh, back end you know the supply chain um people buying it delivery on time etc uh but today now you are experimenting with brick and mortar setups so uh, um even though the business model you know where we are seeing a lot more stuff going on is on quick commerce and hyper local delivery um in your opinion do customers still really want a physical store experience uh, why are we seeing this shift from online to offline and if you could help us you know understand some challenges some opportunities especially for offline stores like fresho uh, from the logistics inventory pricing point of view that would be awesome okay so as i'll just put this problem one simple question to you ha ah. how much do you think is the uh, grocery uh, market in india uh, top line uh, some some i might be very off uh, okay let me help you it's in hundreds of billions so now tell me something some number not so 500 billion dollars no that's too much yeah it's close to that close to that yeah 500 600 billion dollars billion market yeah okay yeah okay now where are our current players we are all grappling for the same pie in quick commerce we are all talking about quick commerce let's look at the what people are talking about and where the market is there is a 500 billion market covering india and we are all talking about a business which is 3 billion of course there's growth not denying it lot of customers preferences have changed it's a growth market and over a period of time we are also sure that people will gravitate towards that but i think there is a huge amount of overestimation of what quick commerce is doing and where the market is today and we see that there is a value market which no one is talking about you have all 
convenience market players everyone wants to do deliveries faster and then there are we also do the slotted deliveries and there are few players also trying to do the value market but not in i mean there are more traders coming in just to be honest i don't want to go there i think it's mostly traders buying in volumes right so uh, there is huge swath of customers who want to buy groceries at a value right and today they have do not have as much of a choice on an online model per se right they are all uh, getting sitting with they're getting their families together on friday evening saturday evening on sundays and they are all going to these big supermarkets and it's a once in a lifetime experience if some of us you should just visit it so has visit one of these stores and just observe people how how they are buying i think some of us have probably have not done this i do that with my team i've told all of them to go and visit these supermarkets and you'll be shocked that is the real india we are talking about they love buying uh on a physical store they look at the prices their eyes hover over the prices they are talking about it this is sasta why don't we buy that so i think uh, my point being to us i think we are all kind of overestimating what hyper local commerce is doing and quick commerce of course uh, there is a sustainability but and i'm not underestimating it there is a huge value there is a there is a, a business out there and and we are confident will make money on that in some point in time but there's a there's a market so to answer your precise question we have to look at customer segments and what they are comfortable with uh, you cannot underestimate the huge market out there who still prefer to go on a friday evening to a store and buy 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 products with a huge value attached to it right i think we are just uh, looking at our tier 1 city and your small cohorts in your in our uh, apartment complexes right so let's understand that which means market segmentation is important to us so internally we look at it this way that there are these side type of customers who look at value there are sets of customers who look at convenience and there are sets of customers who want a bit of balance view on value and convenience right if i were to put this across your convenience pure convenience is in the form of your 10 minute or we call it we be now you know 15 30 minute deliveries hyper convenience and then bb daily is also some kind of convenience at the doorstep our slotted deliveries that we do gives you a different kind of convenience it gives you convenience of range a range of almost 1 lakh products which you probably won't find anywhere maybe next day delivery right and people should be okay if you're buying some long tail product which it's very hard to find today right uh, you have some horizontal commerce players where you buy it if you get it in 2 3 days you get it tomorrow morning right so uh, we play that game and people are okay with 3 4 hour deliveries so that's also to some extent a mix of value and convenience but your largest market today lies in your big stores out there now coming to uh what are these customers looking for when they go to these stores these are moments right where they they want to talk about look at the price and they they evaluate whether this is cheaper than their neighborhood kirana or if you buy this four items in bulk they'll get this discount it's a different kind of an experience not something that you can attach on a mobile phone where it's just one person looking at this and someone else your spouse or someone looking at it at a different point in time it's definitely not that kind of an experience it's a collaborative experience people love doing this and when you give them give this to them at a reasonable price and cost i think we have a great model in place so in fresho we look at it in two different prisms let's build out these mod this uh, brick and mortar model models in in a manner that where you can bring in we can empower every type of customer to come in be it someone who loves doing offline brick and mortar shopping but is reasonably well to do right who comes and parks his, his or her bmw and goes into a store but at the same time it's someone who is not so well to do you know such a person is empowered to come in it's slightly more democratic or empowered right we want to them to come in and that's why we bring in languages in our consoles and wherever we launch our brick and mortar stores we want to empower every kind of person to come in and buy do value shopping number 2 we want to also not bring in people to who who are checking this out building queues etc people should feel empowered to go to a console and let technology manage this right that is a huge differentiator for us because you don't want to be judged or gauged by someone who's sitting there and asking you not to come in or come in right so building self checkout counter brings in that whole experience you put your products in there's a computer vision tech that we have built in house it does all the calculations checks and balances and your bill comes out and you just pay scan and just move out so that's a, that's how we have envisioned building the fresho model 
we're seeing huge traction and that's a business that we are very bullish on in the coming years amazing thanks so much for sharing that just quick question uh, pure net margins online grocery delivery versus offline grocery delivery do you have some thoughts on it do you think uh, it's more where, where is it more profitable in general good question uh, it's how you put you, you how you plan your business model mm-hmm. so that your delivery cost is reasonably i wouldn't go into percentages but it it costs it costs you quite a bit in fact in our cost stack your delivery costs are probably taking up the maximum right come on and you know groceries is a wafer thin margin business right, right. so if, if i look at an online business there are just way too many factors to get your store front ready you know all the campaigns you run and having all the merchandise set building all that and getting it up and running you have huge tech cost to run and all the all that right uh, if you then look at it this is the cost involved in running an online business when you look at an offline business you have to unlearn this completely offline business doesn't work like that so there is of course you don't have your delivery costs attached but then there is a value that you need to bring to the customer because here the 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 vision that a customer has is they can see five products together right in your small screens maybe they can scroll up to five times and maybe they stop there so here all your competing products on the shelves are you know they have to give the best value to your customer and then people have their own choices there is a little less scope on personalization right so your whatever price you put it's all what it is right so if you finally were to talk about profitability uh, a lot of the delivery cost that we incur in the online business probably gets plowed in the offline business if you just think about it as a store but there are different costs accrued in running the store you'll probably need people to maintain the hygiene of the store of course we do that in our warehouses and our in dark stores but i think because a customer is coming in maybe we do it thrice a day in our stores there in our uh, online model here probably right. we need to do every hour so there is a slight difference in how you want to maintain the store and how you want a cus- customer to experience it apart from all those nuances of self checkout etc so so cost i think you will have to gauge it on how your business is modeling it if you are a premium offline store of course you can make a lot of money there are no delivery cost but mm-hmm. uh, i think you'll have to gauge on how you want to run your business very interesting so i think it comes down to how you're running the business what is your business model like um but they just in today's market right we are we're approaching where uh, everyone's calling it a funding winter you spoke about sustainability um have you been able to you know you and your product teams product marketing team specifically have you all been able to figure out maybe a low cost acquisition model and then you know have you been able to can you work us through some retention uh, loops that you know you 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 know strategize upon and anything you can share on that super so uh, i'll answer it in two parts i'll start about with the acquisition piece right of course we look at how we onboard our customers uh, and then i look at big basket as a holistic platform which does multiple business lines so we can we we have the opportunity to enable synergies across all our other product lines and businesses and customers who probably like slotted deliveries we ask them to try out the quick commerce people who are trying quick commerce and from a product perspective the one key thing your product needs to enable from day one is the ability to have a good amount of data for you to understand and segment customers if those tools are not there with you i think you are already in a, in a dark when it comes to acquiring customers uh so so build in those right tools build in the right data pipelines to be able to extract and get insights out of it and create sharp targeted campaigns to get these sets of customers and and to be very honest so has i think the trick is to be able to do targeted marketing uh we have learned that when suhas if i target suhas and tell him subhas likes pizza and i put out a pizza base for example as a you know as a banner or an asset and as soon as he goes inside bb now and say hey this is a good great deal for you high high propensity that suhas is going to buy it and in fact he'll be very happy with it right we done a huge amount of experiments to kind of work with a personalization model i agree maybe your new customers probably it's a lot harder because you don't understand what segment and what are they looking for but we have learned over a period of time what are the nudges and levers what attract customers when it comes to grocery buying experiences 
So if I were to kind of create a framework for people learning, trying to learn how to lower your marketing costs, uh, acquisition costs per se, uh, understand your core product, understand the kind of customers that you are attracting, understand their motivations and incentives of what they like, what they don't like, and then target them accordingly. Get these customers onboarded. When it comes to customers, if you want to retain them, I'm just moving to the retain retention bit. Uh, you would have learned over the past their past ordering experiences, what they prefer and what they like. So don't uh, try to play around by showing them 100 other things. Give them what they want as best as you can while trying to upsell at multiple moments in the journey, right? And that is a trick, right? Your customers need to find you, find that they trust you, they like what they are giving them in the journey. While at the same time, you are you are building up their dopamine by giving them some interesting products in the journey and keeping them engaged, right? Uh, so my larger framework would be, um, you know, retention and acquisition all looks at data, build up that those right motivations for your first customers uh, and, and uh, motivators for your first customers, give them what they want. And for your retained customers, do far superior targeted marketing with what you have. Got it. Um, thanks for sharing that, Teja. Teja. Um, quick question. You have been around now for a long time. Definitely one of the market leaders in terms of revenue, customer base. And from what I could find online, I think more than 10 million customers with over 35,000, 30, 35,000 products across 25 cities today. Uh, it might be more. Maybe the article is outdated, but, um, that means you have a large presence today in the Indian market. Internally, have you all had discussions of expanding this globally? And if there have been, what are some factors or challenges that you face so far? Um, or if there is something on the roadmap, we'd love to hear your thoughts around this. Sure. Uh, I'll keep it short. We, we have thought about it, but like I said, uh, 500 billion, um, so has, there's yeah. just a long way to go and there's just so much, so much to do. Our preference would be to kind of cover the hinterland, give customers the value of what Big Basket gives them. They're buying at MRP today's in the villages, right? How do we build our supply chains to an extent and build that kind of a density to serve them at a much better cost, a faster turnaround in terms of churning stock and building that kind of an experience. So to be very honest, these thoughts have come in, but we have been very focused and clear that, you know, let's just... Uh, let's just work with the Indian market. There is so much to do and uh, kind of build this for India overall. I think that's been an internal thing. And also your other, uh, other stakeholders in this whole building build up exercise are your farmers. We work with almost 30,000 plus farmers and uh, we do this with our delivery folks, our pickers. I mean, as many a number. So there's just so much opportunity for to grow that base and, and build uh, kind of jobs and livelihood for all of them. So all in all, I think there's just so much to do here in India. So us, so no intention to move this abroad, but uh, sure. there are some other product lines that we might revisit, not necessarily grocery specific, but where we might target a lot more larger global audience. And we'll talk about it. Yes, if we have yeah. the chance. No, absolutely. I think that is a fair point. I think huge, huge market here. Uh, double down on this before uh, moving out. Um, just quickly switching tracks slightly. I think we've gone way deep into big basket and your product journey, but I'd like to zoom out a little bit. Um, from some folks we spoke at uh, big basket, they uh, also did share about, you know, your, a little bit about your team management, a little bit about your leadership philosophy. Um, and one particular thing uh, that someone mentioned that of course, uh, you know, being the head of product at a very large company like this, there is definitely a lot of stress, there's lots of pressure, but you seem to be always calm under this pressure and have very high patience. So what is your secret to being so composed? <laughs> okay. Uh, interesting. Uh, see, I see, uh, you know, there are always problems. I think, uh, I think the, the key is to first understand what is the real problem. So as when people bring up their problems, uh, you know, uh, I think there are statements, uh, this is what is happening, etc. I think it all needs one to go slightly deeper, understand with data, what is the real problem. And nine out of 10 times I've realized that uh, this is not the problem that was originally called out. And what is the real problem? I think there is a remarkable difference between the two. And you could realize that these problems are easily solvable or something which you don't need to fuss over. 
right? Um, I think that I don't know. Maybe the calmness comes out of the confidence that all these are not necessarily going to hurt servants us so suddenly that world is going to break. Maybe COVID was the only time when all of us were just looking at this and what what how is the world changing so quickly? But I think it comes with the confidence to us of the what we have done over the years, built that kind of a business with where customers really love us for what we are doing, and uh, all all that happens. As much as we talk about quick commerce, for example, today our our while and quick commerce continues to grow, our largest business continues to be slotted delivery. Just a year ago, our competition used to make fun of slots, but here we are that are still our largest part of a business continues to grow on the slotted delivery. So uh, that calmness, if you ask me, comes from the confidence that maybe it's just a lot of it is faff, and I think the truth lies in what customers believe in, and I think all that matters is trust to us. Very interesting. Um, does that mean do you all have a special way to do customer interviews? Maybe like uh, do you all spend a lot of time? Do you can you walk us through some processes um, at Big Basket, uh, which can help us understand sure. how is it that you know you've been uh, maybe just a little ahead of the curve in what the customer actually wants rather than rather than the faff. Got it. Got it. So we look at. Uh, Uh, uh our experiments or surveys i call it uh, we look at it in two ways uh one is uh one is before we even envision or do something these is these are market research i'll club it under market research and uh, there are very sharp questions and we understand demographics i think most folks would understand how this is done but a simple articulation of this would be you know look at us very simple non leading questions and probably this customers just have one option yes or no or a very simple list of you know two three options that they can choose from right so these are pre pre product or pre you know just trying to understand the pulse of the customer a lot of our understanding also is happens more out of experiments and post product journeys that we create simple way to look at it is we create a poc we'll run it through a customer either via directly using ap experiments run it through a customer directly on the app or we take we do our cohort of customers we identify segments reach out to them call them put, uh, list out some time slots and work work it out with them right whichever approach you try uh, if you if you try the online model you'll actually know how the customer is navigating through the journey uh, we have event events which tell us at every instant of the journey what a customer is looking at what is the hot spot and how the customer is behaving Uh, there are even videos embedded to understand for such some cohorts on what a customer is navigating through in some of these and very very controlled in a very controlled manner not from a privacy perspective uh, so this is on the online journey when we go to an offline journey i mean work directly with customers again we have mocks we ask customers to go through it and then they'll just fill up a small questionnaire questionnaire and they'll answer some of these question what they felt about it typically conversations don't yield too much we do have a channel where we go, we have a, a, a you know a survey model where you have people just product managers also at times calling up customers and trying to understand you know what they felt about this functionality what do what do they think about it etc but i think the point i'm trying to make is we believe and quantitative view is far superior than a qualitative view uh, and that's been our philosophy right so uh, because uh, i think very interestingly the same customers we have tried this once we asked them what do you think about this they were all gung ho oh, this is amazing this is amazing yeah when the time came them for to when we piloted this and we saw those same customers behaving they actually did not do what they said they would do right. customers are also finicky and with different customers behave different we have learned this over the years so our belief is the proof is in the pudding you build pocs you get it out in the hands of your customers let them test it out and don't talk to them actually give them questionnaires and so that they can articulate what they are feeling at that point and of course with data that you already have on what they are doing in the as part of the journey interesting interesting i think i deviated a little bit but i want to bring it back to our leadership conversation because uh, your team definitely wanted us to prod a little harder on this uh there just two parts to this next question again back to your philosophies on team management one is at the leadership level especially for senior folks tuning into this podcast um for a company like big basket how do you even come up with something like a north star metric right if you can share with us um you know how do you 
how do you drive this at an org level number 1 and with that if there are some leadership frameworks that have really helped you in shaping organizational culture right a product organization culture if you could share that with us that would be awesome super uh i think one philosophy we've always maintained uh, is our reviews with uh, you know our uh, leadership and trying to get where is the organization headed and what are the most important things the organization is looking for you asked me uh, you know a north star metric well this evolves over every quarter or every half year and it's based on where the market is we can't just have one single metric at this at the organization level and take this through and through every year or year on year it is very very contextual at that point in time uh, on a on a 3 to 6 month window now the question that we ask is hey what are the x most important things that matter to all of them a lot right interestingly we have three founders co-founders today whom we work with all of them have very interesting perspectives they someone will say we have this we have that it makes it a lot harder by the way because you you need to kind of merge all of this and build a common framework out of it right you know and we want to focus on this category then you know we want to look at being profitable we want to look at this we want to build productivity do more with less so these are the answers so so at a leadership level kind of articulating this into three to four bullet points i mean I, i i don't have anything very systematic to call about but when i go back to my team the only thing i tell them is hey these are four things that we have to work towards based on all the inputs that we have gotten from founders right from from the leadership i would say and we have to work with these four tenets right for this quarter now our roadmap has to be geared with these four tenets so what are we trying to what are we planning to build and it all comes bottom up i think the one key thing since you asked about leadership is i don't necessarily want to go and say hey we need to build this or we need to build this to follow these tenets i push these four tenets to the teams and ask them to come back with what are you going to do to enable that kind of an impact on each of these four areas or at least couple of them in their areas right and the team comes up with what they want to do so in my view that builds up ownership when yes. things go bot top down it doesn't build the right level of ownership ownership comes when you tell them i need to do these four things as a as a end goal more from a metrics perspective not star like you mentioned so tell me what will what will impact this and to a to a significant degree it creates ownership the team comes back what will be the game changer items and secondly you empower them finally to to build this through and through right you right. don't get involved into the nuances of oh uh, you know because i'm just a little bit senior i want this particular feature please include it you empower them you give them recommendations but you let them build the whole product i think that's the culture that we have worked with and i think it has i'm um, touch wood helped uh, build this over yeah. the years so us awesome 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 there's a um probably a bunch of other questions that i had for you but uh, time now for our rapid fire Most which I'll ask you one or two fun questions as well. Um, this one is slightly different. We will ask you a couple of questions, which is an either or. You'll have to pick one. So we have eight on this stack. Um, being the CPO, being the VP product at uh, Big Basket, um, it's an either or. So whatever comes to your mind first, you need to go for it. Um, as a product manager, are you more of a data person or intuition? Data. Data. Are you a morning person or a night owl? Uh, night owl tonight. <laughs> okay, nice way of putting it. Uh, in today's market, growth or profitability? Profitability. Profitability. Has that always been the case? Always been. You could uh, you could have asked me two years ago, and I would have said this. So, is that a bootstrap mentality in a VC back startup? Is that some? I mean, I always believe I'm building it for the business. So I need to show the money. I uh, I mean, if 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 I'm heading product, I'm not there to build a technology product which does nothing. It has to give some Means returns. Up. I need the dividend absolutely. at the end of the day. Absolutely, absolutely. They just pizza or biryani? A pizza. Pizza. Uh, are you more of an innovator or do you focus more on optimization today? Optimization. Optimization. I think as as you scale, um, again in today's role as a CPO, is it vision or execution? 
Hmm. This I was very, uh, I, I must tell you, this was extremely hard. Uh, this is extremely hard a question for me. Yeah. Uh, uh, so again, I will say this is vision today, maybe execution tomorrow. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. Two more on this stack, Android or iOS? Are you a fan? Android. Boy? Android. Android fanboy. Last one. Android fanboy. Nice. On user loops, acquisition or retention, where do you think your strength lies? Retention, retention. Very clear. Retention. Yeah. That's more good. We come to the end of this segment, but to end this off, if you could have dinner with any person in history, uh, who would that be and why? Okay. Okay. This is going to cause some controversy, but it will be Elon Musk, both for the good and the bad. <laughs> okay. Nice, huh? uh, probably the hottest tech celebrity right now, again, for the good and, uh, I think for the good, for sure. I think lots to learn on that dinner, but, uh, they just, as always, I think it has been a fantastic, uh, fantastic chat. Uh, before I let you go, I think, uh, for most of our listeners, one thing that they'd love to ask you is, um, some interesting insights on the product skill side, right? So there are some young product managers, some mid-level product managers tuning in. Um, how do you personally manage to stay ahead in your career? And any tips or tricks for them, especially given today's market, if there are people who want to upskill, who want to, um, you know, switch tracks, want to do, um, want to grow in their careers, any tips or tricks for them? I think my experience suggests, and this is what I tell a lot of folks in my team, right? The young folks, uh, I think there is no point looking at your peers, chasing work in startups, build great impactful products because that builds up the kind of experience that very few people can talk about. So you, you have an option to jump to uh, very heavily funded and, you know, have some senior position and make a lot of money early in your career versus a startup. Pick, pick the startup because there is just an explosion of skills that you will learn and don't just dabble into one part of the product. Be curious, learn more because by the time you're 30, I think if you have a good sense of the in and out of how business runs, how each and every component of the product works, I think that's a life skill in itself. No MBA school can give you that. You are a, It's a super MBA of sorts that you would have already gathered and you can go and give talks and presentations to 100 other MBAs, right? So early part of your career, get deep into startups and uh, learn as much as possible. Don't follow the money trail that hurts a lot of people in their career because then you probably achieve early success and then there's no going back and it's actually detrimental to your learning. If you're in a much, if you're looking for something a lot more stable and, you know, get into a regular corporate job. And I think that's the space, a very healthy work-life balance. But I think uh, the difference between the two, I would say the, the earlier one, the former one is a high risk, high reward. If you do well in your startup and you carry that influence right and right through and through across the startup ecosystem, people will talk about this person next. He's built, he or she built some fantastic products, understands concepts, understands business, right? And high risk, high reward. Like I say, you'll always end up uh, winning the long game, as I say, right? And uh, uh, of course, if the if it is the former, then low risk, low rewards. I think you might get some rewards in the early stage, but uh, according to me, a slightly more conservative approach. But I think he left it to each and one. I mean, how they perceive their life to be. Got it. Uh, high risk, high reward is something that I think I will take away from this. There's just to end it off. Also, um, there is something that a lot of people don't talk about is. Uh, there is a slight sense of FOMO that a lot of youngsters today are going through. Um, maybe because we are all so hyper-connected on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and everyone's just sharing their success stories, right? I think uh, we just see the tip of the iceberg. We don't see the failures. We don't see the hard work behind this. We don't see the hours and hours of effort. Everyone just thinks everyone else is getting lucky. Why not me? Um, in this entire hyper-growth phase, you mentioned, yes, definitely startups, high risk, high reward. Um, and of course, lots of great opportunities, no doubt about it. But um, how do you deal with this underlying level of, you know, this fear of missing out or this uh, feeling that I'm not uh, there yet, right? Uh, have you ever faced something like this or, you know, your teams, well, um, has anyone else brought this up to you? Good, good question. Uh, I think, uh, and maybe a bit philosophical, but this is one's own journey. 
bit of a self actualization journey in maslow's hierarchy i think a lot of people get swayed by what their folks do and how much they are earning and what uh, you know i need to do better why am i here in this path and all that my only advice uh, going by this is if you trust yourself and you are confident of what you are bringing to the table never lose hope uh, there are failures all around one very interesting anecdote so has uh, and i i was not too surprised to hear this uh, people in the west they reward uh, you know uh, resources or employees who have failed before and it's actually seen in a better light but when you come to india i think a failed startup is just a no go i think that's the kind of social standing that people look at and peer standing that people look at in india uh, my advice is that i think the moment you isolate yourself from all the noise and you focus in what you are good at and you want to learn and build that kind of a growth mindset i think there is there is almost a 0.1 probability that you will ever fail in life i mean 99.9% you will you will succeed because you have built that those right kind of skills and the learning in your early part of your journey so so in a sense i think failures only make you stronger they only make you fo- focused on what is important and what is not important and i think take failures in your stride without failures then bro you probably not seen adversity so this funding winter is the right moment when you know it to my uh, i mean i find it a bit humorous because we have always been lean and we see a lot of companies struggling to manage this but i think it's interesting to see how a lot of people are starting to see adversity and they're trying to do better than what they are which is great i think this is the event that india needed to probably see how you can scale up products by still being profitable thanks so much for sharing that tejas and uh... as always i think whenever i chat with you walk away with tons and tons of insight and personal learning as well so thanks once again uh, for joining us today i know it's been a long chat but we did cover a lot of things right from your personal journey to um, you know a lot of interesting insights about um, the hyper local delivery space lots around groceries and big basket and then of course uh, some leadership principles and i ended that with you know a beautiful gem uh, very short on how how you shared on how we can manage careers right so thank you so much for this and uh, we're definitely going to you know stay in touch and uh, catch you once again very very soon to, very very soon to see um, how you know your career is also uh, going from leaps to bounds so thanks once again tejas lovely having uh, lovely being here and uh, fantastic thank you so much so as this was a great conversation thanks tejas